It's great to see you this evening. My name is David Plyler. I'm with the Music Division of the Library of Congress. And um, I'm extremely happy to have you all here for this performance of the Tetzloff Trio. Uh, I guess they really go by Tetzloff, Tetzloff Boat, but it's a bit of a, a hand, uh, earful to try to get through that. Um, so tonight, um, I'm gonna play this by ear a little bit. We, had a, we have a little bit of a technical difficulty with sound, so I'm not gonna be able to play sound examples like I wanted to. So I'll try not to make it too dry. I, I'll do my best to, to, to not do that, because um, it's always easier to hear with, uh, with the sound. But um, we'll take a look at uh, the three trios that we're gonna hear tonight with a focus more on the Mozart and Dvorak. Um, the reason for that was, and we'll still talk about the Shostakovich, but the reason for that is twofold. One, I figured that maybe the Shostakovich is the most well-known piece on this program. Um, that, that may or may not be true, but there's, there's some more information in your notes, and you can also check out more about it um, um, elsewhere as well. Um, but the, the other one is that um, we have access to public domain sheet music for the other two, so we have more examples to draw on from there. Um, so uh, the types of things that I want to talk about are going to be uh, uh, looking at, uh, and I tend to do this whenever we do piano trio concerts, I think it's really interesting to think about orchestration. And usually when, when one thinks about orchestration, you think of like you know, having a big orchestra and how do you write for, how do you divide up the melody and uh, accompanimental parts across this large spectrum of an orchestra that you have. Um, but in some ways, and uh, Shostakovich is known to have said this, um, paraphrasing this, um, it's easier to write orchestral music than it is to write chamber music well. <laughs> and part of that is that you have uh, a limited number of voices that you're dealing with, and you have extremely uh, transparent, uh, uh, the sound is very transparent to people, so when you start to um, do something that doesn't work, it's much more obvious than it is in an orchestra where you can cover it up with a, you know, give it a big, uh, you know, gong uh, ring or something like that and, and you know, cover up your, your sins that way. So when we look at early piano trios, and specifically I'm thinking of, of uh, Haydn and Mozart trios, um, and, and by the time Mozart was writing uh, this trio that we're gonna hear tonight in, in B flat um, from 1786, he was producing um, uh, uh, trios that were uh, started to have greater independence of voices. Um, prior to this, you you started you really had these. It, it was almost like a sonata or something like that for a piano that had string accompaniment, and so um, at least that's the way what people characterize that. I have a little bit of a, take a little bit of issue with that characterization just because it is a very different sound if you were to lose those strings. So, you know, I think Haydn would probably agree and say, hey, you know keep the strings. Um, but in any case, it starts to become a bit clearer why or how uh, a composer might uh, do something interesting in a chamber context when we get to this particular trio by Mozart. Um, it came at a kind of a productive time. He just finished The Marriage of Figaro. Um, he was just about to write the Prague Symphony. He had, uh, he wrote, uh, I'd say about a dozen major works within a six month span. <laughs> of this time, and it's hard to think of uh, the, um, how quickly uh, some of these composers worked uh, and how uh, it, it's strange it is for us to kind of go back and pick these pieces apart that were maybe not in their heads for all that long before they just moved on to the next piece. Um, but it's what makes, you know, when we make these commentaries about uh, ways that they're developing, that's why you kind of start to trace these things piece to piece. It's because they didn't spend, you know, five years working on this so single piece. Um, so anyway, uh, we'll take a look at the, at the opening. You'll see that there's actually, it is kind of piano heavy, <laughs> you might notice. Um, so, and we'll hear this, uh, it's lovely, you'll like it, I'm sure. Um, but what you'll see are there, there are, oops, there are some, um, you can see that the cello is basically playing a bass line and adding a little bit of, uh, um, harmonic coloration at the end, but it doesn't do anything that the piano is not doing. Um, you'll see that the violin, whenever it speaks, it has like a little turn figure that it throws in there. Um, but that's that's pretty much it for the beginning. But what Mozart has done in this very uh, 
in a very small space of time is he's introduced elements that are going to be kind of important for the entire movement and actually for the entire piece. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, elements that kind of continue on throughout the entire piece. Um, so I've just identified a couple of those, and, and in the notes they're labeled W, but <laughs> um, in this case they're in red squares. And that's just the, the main theme. The first thing, if you look at that top line, where you have that, that very top line, F, E, G, F, and you look over to the, to the one on the right where the violin is playing it, um, eventually the violin comes in to join. And this is a type of um, almost like mimetic development or development through um, mimicry. So it creates a different texture when you have um, piano presentation and then piano plus another instrument, in this case the violin. Um, nothing terribly profound there. Um, but then you also have these, uh, these little tags, little melodic tags I call them, that the violin introduces at the beginning that seem like throwaway gestures at first, just kind of like a little commentary on what's been heard in the piano. Um, eventually though, um, that starts to take on a greater melodic significance. Um, you'll hear this, there's not a ton of examples here, but you can see them in the red squares. Um, there's yet another element that's introduced, and this is kind of more actually uh, dealing with a rhythm. It's a idea of a da 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 da, just four eighth notes with the last one being on, on a downbeat. Um, you'll understand why I'm focusing on that in just a few minutes when I get to that spot. Um, in this example, I've kind of boxed out a bunch of those examples that are just here in the red. Um, and then the uh, blue ones uh, show just this little uh, half step alternation idea that comes into play as well. So these are just a little, little ideas that by themselves don't really mean a whole lot. You'll recognize them, but then when Mozart starts to use them over and over again and put them into kind of different contexts, they take on a greater uh, meaning. So as we just saw those little uh, melodic tag that the, that the violin had, um, I mentioned that it would have a greater significance. As we get going, you start to see this notion of doubling and alternating. Um, so up at the top there, um, you see that initial doubling that I showed the, with the violin uh, doubling the uh, piano down an octave. So it's kind of in this middle register that's not otherwise occupied by anybody. And then down at the bottom in the, um, in the blue box, you'll see an alternation starting to develop between this turn idea and then that little da 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 idea <laughs> um, in, the, in the blue box. So you'll see that's going with the violin to the piano, violin to piano. It's important here to notice that these are just two voices. Where's the cello? Taking a break. <laughs> um, so you know, they, that's kind of, it's one of those th uh, things that uh, composers of piano trios and other types of things will do this a lot. They'll change the orchestration so that it focuses on two members of the group or uh, three out of four or things like that just to, give, to change the texture. Um, when you get to the red ones, you'll start to see uh, that the turn figure is starting to become more and more prominent and it's alternating back and forth. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily giving us greater melodic information, but it's just a, a type of development of the material. Um, then we start to see that this notion of alternating is continuing, but now with the cello adding at least one held tone. Uh, cellist is still a little bit on the board side, um, but we have uh, what you'll notice in the top little two measure example is that the, the same exact pitches are played in the piano first in the top and then are played by the violin and then back, and then back to the violin again. So see this kind of going back and forth? Um, it doesn't matter so much that you can hear this by looking at it, but you can see the pattern. It's just a pattern that's getting repeated in different ways. And of course, the way that Mozart puts that together, we like to listen to it. So um, that's kind of a key uh, factor. Um, but one of the other things that's kind of un unusual about this is that, um, at least to my ear, um, with a piece like this, is that when you get to that bottom section, uh, the doubling starts to continue in kind of a, uh, where the, the right hand of the piano is in a very high octave while the violin is below it and it just has this very interesting textural effect. I would like to show you that um, example but you'll have to just wait and hear it. Uh, it's just something that's unusual and of course Mozart as a keyboardist and uh, performer, uh, viola, violin, anything like that would have uh, known exactly how this would sound in the context.
course, the keyboard instrument matters too, but we're not going to get into that right now. Um, later, as this, as this uh, piece gets going, we start to have a role reversal, where at first the piano was the one that was presenting the material in the main. Uh, we now start to have the main melodic material in thirds and sixths presented in the strings against the little uh, filigree uh, ornamental figures in the piano this time. So that kind of a thing happens. Let this be one example among many. So these are, this is in no way comprehensive. Another thing that Mozart starts to do as it gets going, and he's actually been doing this since the very beginning, but it starts to become more clear, especially um, as we recollect what has happened before, imagining that we're hearing this for the first time, um, that da, 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 um, thing starts to become a bit more prominent, um, and we start to hear it, um, it starts to be, um, it starts to, its significance start to be, starts to become uh, more clear. Um, and especially as we start to get to some little cadential passages uh, towards the end of the movement, we hear um, an ornament uh, that comes before. You see those little uh, tiny notes. Um, <laughs> so you hear this kind of a, a leap that comes before in the red boxes with the piano, violin, piano. Um, but you'll hear in each of these, uh, can you see my uh, cursor on there? Um, so, so here's the da, 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 da right there. And then here's the, uh, uh, the, the ornament. And here's the ornament there. And then the da 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 da. And then here's another ornament. Da 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 da. And then same over here. Um, it's the alternation again. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Um, that sounds a little Beethovenian, but da 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 da. But Mozart came first. Um, <laughs> and uh, that uh, is now kind of saying that this is going to be, what's interesting about that. It doesn't seem, this seems like I'm belaboring like this um, little tiny point, but what's interesting about it is that this happens most prominently at the end of the movement. And then when we look at the next movement, it starts with the da 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 ba da. And so it incorporates that um, group of four and then also the ornament. So you'll see that in both of the red boxes. So that's where the piano starts and also where the, the violin starts. And you don't have to, you know, take my word for it. See, listen to it and see if it, what it sounds like to you. But it, to me, it's a very clear connection, especially because it comes one right after the other. When we get to the final movement, we find that the same basic thing is there, except we're now we're missing one of the bums. Um, so it's just, uh, it, but it does keep the ornamentation, and uh, you can see in the red box there. Plus it has a variant of the, of the turn figure um, comes back prominently, the one that you see in the blue. So this is uh, you know, a little bit of a, uh, a selection of some of the elements of what Mozart would do in this kind of a work. Um, I almost think probably without thinking about it much, I think it was probably a pretty natural thing. Um, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a common type of thing to do at the time. Um, and so uh, the last thing I'll say about this piece is that uh, I'm realizing that I left out one uh, example that I thought was fairly um, interesting. So I'll just describe it for you <laughs> briefly. And that is that um, one interesting component of writing for a piano trio is that you have a lot of registral space that you can use on the piano or key whatever keyboard instrument you're using, less space the earlier you go. Um, and then you have some different registers that you would typically use with a cello, um, with the lowest string at a C, um, and then going up, but you know, not, keeping, not getting too high. The instrument sounds different in each, uh, in its different tessitura, so different, um, uh, it just sounds different in different parts of the range. And then a violin, of course, you'll be thinking of that as a higher instrument. So what Mozart does in a lot of this is he'll stratify the parts so that they're occurring within one particular register while the other instruments are occupying those other, par other parts of the register. So you might have uh, you know, outer voices of the piano, and then you'll have two inner voices where the uh, violin and the cello are actually in the middle register. And this is a very strange thing in terms of what I hear sonically in the third movement um, that you'll hear, which are these held tones 
um, in that central component, um, central register uh, against the piano, piano's outer, uh, outer movement. So it's kind of a, um, usually um, he's, he's more active with those types of things or the, um, in terms of how the strings are being used. Um, but at times he just uses, uses them as a pad. Um, and so it's, it's a uh, interesting thing to keep note of. I bring that up also because the next piece that we'll touch on briefly, the Shostakovich um, second piano trio, um, utilizes this to an extreme degree. And, um, and this is, uh, Shostakovich is uh, kind of famous for using uh, octaves uh, in the pian piano writing, single, like each hand is playing the same thing at unison, but octaves apart. And it's a very uh, uh, great uh, and distinct type of sound. It, every, type, every time you play uh, piano music at the octave, that's a very clear sound. Two octaves apart, that's a different sound. Three octaves apart, that's a different sound. It might be the same exact pitches, but those octave changes that are made uh, make a big difference in terms of how we perceive the music. Um, you can hear, um, uh, you'll hear this tonight in the, um, in the second piano trio. Um, we call it the second piano trio, but it, um, the first piano trio was a student work. Uh, I think it was written in 1923. Um, and so you don't hear that as much, but this piece um, was written in 1944. Um, he had started the first movement um, and was working on it um, when he learned of the death of a friend, Ivan Solotinsky, who was a musicologist and also uh, just a dear friend of his um, who passed away suddenly of a heart attack. Um, he had just recently been speaking about Shostakovich's music, in particular the Eighth Symphony, and uh, it was a devastating blow for Shostakovich. Um, much is always made of this component of the piece, this kind of extra musical component as a, uh, a rationale for why the piece is as it is. And it's a difficult thing to you know, dismiss because of course these types of things affect composers just like they would affect any other human being who loses a friend or uh, a loved one. Um, but there's oftentimes a very um, intense need to describe what's happening in the music as being, you know, uh, this is indicative of this particular loss or something like that. Um, in the case of, of the Shostakovich, I think there's a pretty good reason to, <laughs> to uh, uh, at least pay attention to this, if not focus on it. And that is um, partly because of, you know, the devastation, devastation that he wrote to Solotinsky's uh, widow about the loss um, that he was experiencing, and also just the general nature of the music uh, itself. It's a very serious work, um, but at the same time it has Shostakovich's uh, kind of trademark irony that comes through in lots of different ways, um, but also is um, uh, a lot of his music uh, can be slow and dark in general. So it's, it's interesting to, to see, to parse what it is that makes this piece uh, particularly attractive to people. But it tends to be, it's a, it's a piece that a lot of people know and a lot of people love, um, and I think with good reason. Um, from the very beginning, and again, I apologize for not being able to just uh, show you these examples, um, but the, uh, from the very beginning, what you'll notice about it is that there's a cello solo, and the cello is playing um, harmonics. So basically, um, the way that this works is the cello is playing, they have a note, and they, they're touching a fourth harmonic, what would be a fourth above that pitch, and it sounds two octaves higher than it's written. And so they're playing these pit, this, it's this really high ghostly sound. And it's weird to, it's, uh, I mean, if you've heard it a lot, then it's not maybe not so strange, but it's this opening of a piece, and it's this high ghostly sound coming from the cello, maybe something you might expect from the violin, but, um, but it's coming from the cello. And so it starts there in this sort of uh, um, imitative, material where you hear the different voices come in slowly. And again, the, the piano is, this is where Shostakovich is using those different registers so effectively. So cello's up super high, um, violin's uh, lower, and then the, the piano's deep in the bass. So we hear these things come in, and this is a very um, elegiac uh, uh, movement. Um, I won't say much about the second movement except to say that um, it was said that Solotinsky's widow thought that this was a, a portrait of, of him. Um, I don't know enough to know if that is, but it has a sort of a, 
Um, it's kind of a, a grotesque waltz in some ways with uh, lots of, uh, uh, where Shostakovich is playing with uh, kind of tropes of very clear uh, triadic arrivals, but then moving away from it just a little bit askance to, to kind of uh, do something interesting. Um, and also kind of, uh, he just likes to look at things from a different angle, I think, than, um, than just making it a straightforward type of waltz. Like, um, if you compare this to, say, well, it's not really a fair, fair thing. I was going to say to compare it to, say, like some of the Prokofiev waltzes around this time, or like uh, Cinderella. Um, but that's, it's a completely different uh, type of thing going on. But they both have this ability to write music that makes you uh, kind of smile and kind of wonder at yourself at the same time <laughs> somehow. Um, the third movement um, is a, is a Posicalia, basically. You have these, the sequence of chords um, that the piano presents and the, um, uh, the uh, strings are, are performing above it. Um, the, the chords repeat themselves over time. Um, and so that's an element that comes back into play in the final movement. And the final movement is the one that most people know uh, very well. And that's, it has this, um, and I, uh, this is not in many way disrespectful, but has a sort of um, uh, Danny Elfman-like um, opening theme in terms of it's like a pizzicato thing. You hear, the, if, if you've ever seen the, the film uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, you'll hear some of this uh, same type of um, writing that Danny Elfman, of course, much later is, is doing um, in that score. But this, it's this, th this element of the, of the grotesque comes very much back into play. So you've got the pizzicato strings against the, uh, the piano, and then, of course, um, this uh, uh, Jewish component that was a, uh, an element that was recognizably uh, uh, related to um, uh, thematic material that, that Shostakovich was becoming interested in and aware of, especially at this time when the atrocities of the Second World War were starting to come to light. Um, you know, and so he was becoming more aware of this, and it began to permeate uh, some of his other works uh, that came later, especially. Um, and so you'll hear, um, it's better just to hear it than to hear me talk about it. So um, so it's, what's amazing about it, though, I think, is that it's, it's so, it's done in such a way that um, uh, there's, there's a certain anguish to it, I think, that, that comes through that's also at the same time you find yourself driven to kind of sing along with it or something. Um, so it's a, a wonderful piece. I, I know you'll enjoy it if you haven't heard it. And if you do know it, it's going to be great to hear it by such a wonderful group that we're, we have tonight. Um, so uh, just in the interest of time, moving on to the Dvorak. Um, how many of you know this piece, this third one? Not too many people. Um, it's not his uh, most famous work, but it's a great one. It's one of the, I mean, I, 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 you always hate to say these words, you know, great and whatever, but, you know, it's a, it's a solid piece, let's put it that way. Um, and it's a serious piece. It's, it's a piece that um, uh, dates from 1883. There's a time when, when Dvorak's star was really rising, and he was, um, Brahms had basically, uh, advocated for him uh, with his publisher Simrock, got Simrock to commission the Slavonic dances. Um, he had been uh, in, uh, do, doing a great uh, deal of work um, in Czech, uh, getting uh, with operas and other types of things that had more of a nationalistic bent to them. And around this time, when he was writing this piece, uh, there was a little bit of pressure to, uh, to be <laughs> kind of conform a bit more to the, the Brahmsian sort of model and, and of, of the absolute music, um, which is also a very problematic thing that we won't get into. But um, that is to say that this one doesn't have any overtly stated Czech uh, nationalistic components to it. Um, uh, people have found them. And um, I think that I think that they are, there are some things that are there um, th in the both in the last movement and also um, uh, in the scherzoish movement. Um, but in any case, Dvorak didn't say, Here's the, here it is in the title, like he would with like the Hussite overture or whatever it was. Um, so there's a couple of um, interesting things that you'll notice about this work. First of all, it's very thick. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean that there's a lot going on almost all the time.
Um, and Dvorak, of course, is well known for uh, uh, use of melody and things like that. And even, even in this opening melody, which is presented in octaves with the strings, um, it becomes complicated pretty quickly. But at the same time, not complicated. And that's, that is to say that it's moving a lot and then sticking where, where it ends up there. So um, there's this uh, melody there that just goes from pianissimo, swells a little bit, comes back to pianissimo, and then which means just really quiet. And then it kind of stays on these Gs, and it keeps staying on the Gs, uh, keeping into this sort of a, um, uh, you'll just notice that uh, where the arrows are, it stays there before eventually moving on. One of the things that you'll notice about, um, about the piece is that there are a lot of different textures, especially in the piano writing, but also in the string writing. Um, and this is really important. I think it shows Dvorak um, at his best with the type of variety of piano writing that he's doing. Um, there's been, I mean, I, I guess it's criticism to say that he's sounding a little bit like Brahms in certain types of things, but at the same time, um, Brahms didn't own all these uh, different types of figurations, and there were um, kind of tools that, that Dvorak could use um, that were quite different. And so one, I've just identified a, a couple of things that are a little bit unusual. Um, one of them is the, um, uh, so you have in kind of rapid succession, you have these alternating octaves. So it goes, th so the left hand is playing in the right hand, left, left, right, left, right, left, right, whoops, sorry. Um, and then when you get over here, you have um, melodic arpeggiated octaves. So that's always, um, that's kind of an unusual thing. So usually when you see um, arpeggiated, uh, those little rolled chord symbols, they're usually associated with a chord or something like that. So that's sometimes they're for practical reasons to allow the hand to stretch and play the entire chord. Um, and you'll often see that in left hand writing. Um, but sometimes when they're in this sort of melodic context, it creates this echo effect and it also tends to emphasize um, whatever the dominant part of the hand is that's playing. So in this case, the, the thumb, because his thumb is heavier. <laughs> and so it has this sort of echo effect that comes through. Minor, minor point, but it's something that, um, that is kind of unusual and it, it creates a unique sort of feel here. And it's not something that he does throughout the movement. He changes uh, these types of um, uh, figurations as he feels the music needs it. Um, so that was, that's the example of the melodic role. Here's an example of a stretch where not everybody can do this big stretch in the bass. So that's probably more of a reason why that there, there's a, a role there between that C and D. Um, you know, another thing that was in the air at the time are types of transformations where you'd have uh, a melody that would be presented in a particular way and then later on you'd have a transformation of that melody would be presented in a different context, perhaps with a different harmony, perhaps with a different rhythm, something like that, but still same recognizably the same thing. This was of course a big thing for, you know, going back to Schubert, Wanderer Fantasy, uh, Liszt, uh, a lot of his music. Um, anyway, you start to see this also here where you have that upper line, these are the blue lines where they have the melodic lines are um, pretty much the same until you get to the last part, um, but the harmonization um, changes. And so it's the kind of thing that happens back to back, very happens very quickly, but the effect is one feels this sort of recognition that we're in the same world that, we're, that we've been in, but there's something as a foot, th things are moving and this is changing. So Dvorak in addition to um, you know, doing things with uh, 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 motivic development and other things like that is also doing things harmonically that make it at the local level feel like we're progressing somewhere, we're moving somewhere. Um, there are also little things that, and these are, I always feel bad whenever I, I don't know why I feel bad about it, but whenever I present a, an example that involves a minor second because those, um, when you have, um, these little half-step kind of warbles going back and forth. That's kind of a common thing to hear in music in general. But um, uh, they, they happen here, and I box them in blue, and they have a certain genesis, I think, that comes from earlier in the, in the movement. And you can see those in the, the blue up there. So it's kind of 
minimal and it maybe is not as as much as saying like there's a full blown melody that Dvorak is you know really kind of representing again later. But I do think that they are connected and that they um, one at least hears it that way. At least I hear it that way. You don't have to hear it that way. I won't be offended if you don't hear it that way. Um, just to say there's nothing new under the sun, uh, what we saw in the Mozart with the types of alternation, we see that here th in Dvorak. So this is another common technique that composers would use. Um, you know, <coughs> Thinking through 19th century composers, uh, I th can't think of one that doesn't use <laughs> this um, type of a, a thing somewhere in their, in their work. So you can just see how, um, I didn't box this one, but the piano does these, these chords, and then the strings do it together, and the piano again, strings. So that sort of a thing. Again, it just kind of creates this dialogue between the instruments. Um, Dvorak was uh, also d would also do certain things like uh, augmentation of a melody. And what that means is just simply, like if you have a, an idea and then you stretch it out to say double its length, that's an augmentation. If you were to take it, make it shorter, there'd be a diminution. And so you can see that the, the red line there, um, the inner voice there gets spread out um, longer um, profile, it, it's not always exactly the same pitches, but um, in this example, um, it's not exactly the same, but the effect that one hears is uh, pretty much that. So things are happening kind of, the same thing is happening at different rates of speed uh, while at the same time while you're listening. Um, that's kind of a been a favorite thing, you know, especially since Bach. Um, we have, just like I mentioned earlier, thematic transformation still comes in. Uh, where the we start to have a different accompanimental figures that come in in the strings, but we still have that little noodly figure that I mentioned about the half steps happening in the in the uh, piano part, um, while the uh, there's kind of more of a m uh, different type of thing happening above. And then um, kind of an interesting thing, if we'll just kind of remember that opening gesture that we started with, um, that really quiet uh, uh, gesture that starts. Uh, uh, there in the pianissimo and goes back to pianissimo. At the end of the movement, um, I know this doesn't seem like uh, such a, uh, a big deal thing for him to do, but the way he does it, I think, is quite extraordinary. Um, basically, we get it, he sets it at, at piano, going to forte and then pianissimo. But he inserts it into the context of this kind of big, uh, big coda thing that's been happening, <laughs> um, but that we, we have the same music. Um, and then there's this, this momentary pause where you see all these uh, fermatas at the end of the blue box and in the piano uh, before he just ends the piece. But what happens is that you have this loud uh, note in the bottom of the piano, um, but after that you hear this, the same music that you heard at the beginning of the piece and you think, oh, it, it, to me it was, makes me think, oh. Um, but it's just this very startling moment where it, and it feels um, special to me in some in some way and then and then he closes it off from there so it's kind of I think what I what it attracts me about it is that he integrates it into a texture and so it just emerges out of it once there's silence to kind of capture that moment um, so it's a really dramatic uh, and well considered gesture I think um, we won't get into uh, it's kind of a allegretto scherzo thing this is um, the Second movement is uh, a dance-like work. We're not going to, I think, I don't think we'll have uh, much to say about this, except that we have more variance in the piano writing that comes through. Um, you'll start to see more of those rolled chords and things like that. Um, one thing I would point out is there are other types of figurations that come in that are, um, you know, not so easy to do all the time. So you have. <laughs> You have this five against four with a roll coming after it. Um, so there's uh, uh, just different things, but it, what it ends up doing is creating a wash of sound in a fast tempo um, that makes, uh, makes for kind of exciting music. Um, another thing that I mentioned that and you start to see this, especially in, in kind of classical writing, when they'll start to write slow movements with uh, 64th notes or 128th notes or things like that, um, when you start to get uh, it started to get too many, uh, too many notes, <laughs> like uh, too too thick. The writing was just too thick. So as you get, uh, you get these textures that look really simple on the page, like these like sextuplets that are uh, in the blue um, at the top of the uh, of 
of the, but at, at a higher velocity, they, um, they have this uh, imp kind of important sound that is more than just the notes themselves. And, um, and you'll kind of hear that against the other kind of slower alternating octaves that you hear in the bottom. And then also the tremolo, which is a very fast kind of moving back and forth um, between, uh, in this case, an octave in the low hand. So um, I'm just bringing it up, up to say that, that things, again, I would rather show it, have you hear it, um, but the, the way that the composer asks a, a performer to accomplish certain things, it's, it's kind of more than the, um, the sum of its parts. The, um, uh, so you'll, you'll just have to hear it and, and then there, the be aware of what the, what the instrumentalists have to do to achieve what the sound is. Um, and the, I bring this up because, um, and we'll get to it in the third movement. Um, I'll explain a bit more of it when I bring it up. Um, in the trio section of this uh, second movement, um, there's some kind of uh, interesting passage work where, where Dvorak is definitely, I think, channeling Schumann uh, via Brahms in terms of like uh, displacing beats and what you're supposed to listen to in a way that can be unsettling over time. Not unsettling in like a uh, existential sort of way, but rather just um, you start to not know exactly what you're supposed to be listening to, where you are located in the bar. And when you're in a, a situation where there's a tightly regimented type of uh, dance or something like that that you're hearing, having that instability uh, tends to generate uh, content like it makes you makes you think about things in a different way and, and want to kind of either get get back in it into it or embrace it and just kind of go with it so he does get back um, on track shortly after this but um, this kind of writing is always interesting to me when it happens especially uh, you know in, in Schumann and, and, and much more earlier music too um, so I mentioned earlier how that uh, I think I mentioned earlier that you know Mozart uh, in the second movement, you had uh, kind of a, a duet between the violin and and the piano. Um, here's another example, again, of just the, another uh, composer doing the same type of thing, but this time having the uh, the cello uh, operate as the soloist with the piano accompaniment. Um, so again, pr providing a textural uh, you know, difference, and then also you'll notice that when the violin does come in. It's another type of imitated gesture. It's very similar to what the, the cello had been playing before. Um, so when I mentioned earlier about the, the thinking about the technical means of production and what a pianist in this case has to do versus um, you know, how the composer asked for it, there's this interesting passage in, um, in the third movement, and I've, it's the one with all the, the 30 second notes here. There's a... Um, there's a, a Dvorak biographer, um, um, his name is actually escaping me at the moment, but who had, uh, but maybe for the, for the best, um, but who basically said that this is, you know, why would, this is the emptiest passage that one could possibly have, why would you do this? And it makes me think that it really depends, it, um, it depends on who's playing it and depends on how they're playing it. And it's a, it's a problem that dogs, composers, um, in general, because sometimes there's, you want to get a certain type of sound and the way that you choose to write it might make people be, people perform it in a way that isn't really what is musically uh, desirable. So in this case, uh, I would think a sensitive pianist like we're going to hear tonight, I have no doubt that it's going to be played in a wonderful way that we're gonna not gonna even notice that this is happening. But you could see how um, somebody might just start to to really be articulating all these uh, um, really fast notes in a way that just kind of creates not a wash of sound, but a muddle of sound, um, especially as it, it keeps going. Um, so it's one of those things where uh, I applaud the different types of textures that Dvorak is going for because he does it with a, a specific goal in mind. And we start to see that as, as we get a little bit later into the piece, um, how he prepares uh, Different, a different type of texture. In this case, a sextuplet 16th texture. Um, you start to see in the upper blue box, you'll see these little um, uh, groups of groups of three uh, 16th, the triplet 16th in the violin, followed by groups of three in the cello, three, 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 and then six, and then they start to, to, to basically establish this um, 
speed of, of execution. The piano takes that over, we hear it again, we keep hearing it, and then we hear that same speed setting the, uh, setting basically the background uh, articulation speed that we hear in the, uh, in the piano, those sextuplets that run just as an accompanimental figure. This is something that is a, I, I think, is a preparation that Dvorak is doing. And it, uh, you know, kind of listening to myself, it sounds you know, kind of you know, boring the way I'm describing it. But hearing it, um, when it gets then to the, the longer melodic notes that we hear in the violin above that, um, it feels like an absolute perfect setup. And so composers will often think of these ways to kind of preempt things and make them feel not that they couldn't be any other way, but give a sense of inevitability to them. Um, that's just one way that Dvorak does that. Um, when we get to the finale, um, this one, uh, uh, I won't say too much about it, except that it's, it's actually a, a pretty significant movement. It's, a, it's a, not just a, a toss away uh, work. Um, there's a, a thoughts that it's a related to a Czech dance, Buryant. Um, but um, Dvorak doesn't say that here, and uh, um, yeah. um, we do have, again, I just wanted to give you a couple more quick examples of alternations and also um, changing the points of entry of those alternations. You'll see in the blue box that you have, uh, you have uh, violin first followed by cello, and you can see that just, you don't have to know the exact notes, but it's just going up, the other one's just going up again. In the bottom part, um, you then have the same thing, but at a faster rate. So instead of the waiting for the violin to finish, the cello comes in earlier. Um, so this is another type of uh, thing. That, and the uh, Dvorak uh, uh, cheats a bit and makes it work a bit better by not having the piano play as much. Oh, that was a little trick. Um, let's see. Um, another type of variation that that uh, Dvorak will do. And the last one I think that I'm gonna mention tonight is that, um, uh, so this is a, a kind of a secondary theme in this in finale. Um, right where I have that big arrow, the little tranquilo um, melody that you'll hear there. Um, later on in the, in the piece, you'll hear a transformation where instead of having it spread out, so orchestrationally you have kind of a, not really much happening in the cello part and the, and the piano part is just kind of holds. Um, it'll all go to the piano part and it has a typically kind of romantic bass, flowing bass line. Uh, but the, um, the cello part is now being uh, kind of occupied by the octaves in the, in the right hand and the melodies in the, in the middle part of the right hand. Um, so this is just another um, way that uh, Dvorak would um, vary his material and then it allows it to kind of um, move into some other uh, music that comes on top of it. So um, the piano is able to take over everything and then everybody else moves forward while the, the piano continues. Um, so with that, I'd just like to say thank you for listening and it was good to uh, at least get a little intro uh, introduction to these pieces. I hope you enjoy them. I'm sure you will enjoy the concert tonight. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'm happy to try to answer anything. If you could just wait for the microphone. Are any of the library's instruments, in, instruments being played tonight, or do, did Not they bring tonight. their own? Not tonight. Not tonight. You'll see most of them over here. Uh, but yeah, no, but I mean, most we keep a lot of them here. Not all of them, though, but um, unfortunately not tonight. Um, one thing I can say about that is that it's, it's often difficult for musicians just to come in and pick up another string instrument and be able to just knock it out of the park. So when, whenever we do have them performed, we need to have several days where the, the musicians can come in and get used to them. It's for their own good and also for our good and so that everybody feels comfortable with them. And that's why we don't have them played as much as we would like to. Okay. So uh, these are very distinct pieces and this is a totally naive question, but is there any thread of um, for this particular combination of instruments, any connections that are known between the composer, between these three particular composers, and choosing these instruments and 
learning uh, from each other or doing something different or the same? Well, um, that's a kind of a big question. You know, one thing I didn't mention is that Dvorak's work was written right after the death of his mother, with whom he was very close. And so that has a certain, it doesn't strike me as an elegy piece in the same way that um, the Shostakovich does or the Rachmaninoff or the Tchaikovsky trios, which were also written as elegies after the passing of a friend and Nikolai Rubinstein for the Tchaikovsky and Tchaikovsky for Rachmaninoff. Um, but the, um, as far as uh, the kind of through lines between them, there's, I think, an awareness that people develop. Um, it's, I don't like to think of it as a progressive one, but rather just an awareness that later composers tended to get of uh, what was happening before. Um, trios in particular, I think, are difficult to, I think they're difficult to write. Um, and part of that is it's just e easier, I think, that like a piano quintet is easier to write for than a piano trio. And that's because you have a bit more space that can be occupied by the strings and, um, and it's not quite as exposed as the other things. And so, um, you know, the, the, the piano, uh, Mozart was writing piano quartets, um, Schumann was writing piano quartets. I guess he wrote probably the first piano quintet, um, major one, uh, major composer to write one at least. And um, then Dvorak did of course, and uh, the Dvorak trios came, these, this is one of two that he wrote that we, he would consider probably a, a mature work um, after he had written a few uh, earlier. I think, uh, I can't remember when he wrote the other ones offhand, but um, there's definitely an awareness that I think generally um, I would probably seek out Mozart and Haydn and these other things if I were a composer living at the end of the 19th century, but I don't know what the resources were like for everybody. Brahms was of course a, a historicist in terms of liking to be aware of, of what was going on, but of course he didn't have access to everything either. Um, as far as like a through line, I, I do think that there's just general types of things that you learn from other composers and those come through mm. in the types of uh, alternation patterns that you see, the types of instrumental uh, register decisions. You'll see that through a lot of the repertoire. And part of that is that there's only so many things you can do um, mm. But then when you get to something like the Shostakovich and you have that opening that's so un unique and unusual, um, it starts, to, it stands apart in some way, not necessarily better or worse, but just it, it helps to give it a little bit of a kind of. Were these specifically, were these commissioned one and were they specific commissioned as trios or? Um, they were definitely all written as trios. Um, I don't believe they were commissioned. I'm not, I'm not totally sure offhand, I don't, I don't believe so. Um, somebody might know that answer, but um, yeah, but it was something that um, you know, each composer at this point was experienced with. Shostakovich had been, it had been 21 years or so since he had written a trio, but um, he was certainly um, experienced with writing chamber music. Uh, and so there's a, and also as a, as a pianist and um, he, he, the other thing with some of these symphonic composers like Shostakovich, they would write. Uh, they would write in such a way, when they're writing for an orchestra, that it would involve different kind of chamber ensembles within the orchestra. So there's also beyond just their string quartets or things like that. There's a, a practical component that you would hear in the symphonies of um, trying things out and trying different combinations. And those kind of I think they feed back into the chamber music in interesting ways. I'm not a Shostakovich scholar, but I just that's just my takeaway just from you know liking his music and listening to it. I um, think we'll go ahead and stop there. Thanks again, everybody. <laughs>